Come on, come on. 13778. I'm pretty sure that's that's it. That's the limit. I don't think it's going to go any further. Now I have tortured this guy right here for about three weeks now, trying to find that perfect balance between core clock, memory speed, voltage, as well as temperatures. Now what I've come up with is a base score, a stock score in 3 Mark Port Royal of, I think it's like 12,800 something ish around there. It varied slightly. I've pushed it all the way up to that last run here of 13,778. Now that's also been enough raw power coming out of this thing to put me in the top 150 of the 4K leaderboards in superposition. Well, it's 157 now, but I swear it was 149 a couple days ago. All of this is possible because I took it out of its Alienware furnace down there and slapped it on a 5950X in this open air test bench from Cooler Master. You can find that in the description below. I also have my AC on the wall there blowing directly at this at about 20 C. So it's getting cold air directly from that, keeping temperatures well below 60 degrees during all of these runs. It's also pretty noisy when you take those fans and turn it up to what is required to keep it down at those temps. Let me show you guys. Let's bring it up to 100%. Still going. Still going. I can feel it in the table now. There you go. That's 100%. Now, of course, that's going to be cooler when it's in a case, but it's still aggressively loud. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to remove this. We're going to tear it down right here so you can see what's keeping all these components cool. And then we're going to try to throw a reference water block from EK on there. And hopefully everything fits. Okay, so it's shut off. This thing is cooled down for ah, a little bit, enough that I won't burn myself. So let's go ahead, unplug everything. Let's tear it apart. So this one does have just two eight pin connectors. I know a lot of the heavily overclocked higher end models do have three eight pins on there. So power is a little bit of an issue when you're pushing this thing. And there it is. Now it does have a little LED strip on the top here, so the GeForce RTX lights up. It's got two fans, relatively noisy fans when you push them. Um, and it is, you know, pretty good size, good weight. Like I said, when you do have direct airflow on it, it can keep temperatures pretty cool. When you put it inside something like the R11 from Alienware, it gets very hot. It gets up to 80s, sometimes a little bit higher than that, depending on your location, where you have it at. If I put it up on my desk here, again, I have pretty good airflow. It's decent. So let's pop it open and see what we have inside. I'm really curious to see what we have for our, our memory cooling, if that is included with the main heat sink there. Because when you look through it, I don't know if you'll be able to see that. I think I took some B-roll shots of that before. You can look straight through here, and it's not connected to the main heat sink on the top. It looks like it has a separate piece going all the way around that connects to everything. So curious to see what that looks like when we take it all apart. I've mentioned this before when I was talking about how this is kind of your only option to get a 3090 right now it's by getting a pre-built. Uh, that this was a, looks like a rebranded MSI card. Judging by the MSI that's on the PCB as well as the part number that lines up with MSI's manufacturer. So I reached out to Dell on that and they haven't really confirmed or they haven't really responded, actually. No surprise there. All right, so as I had mentioned, and part of the issues with the R11 was, was the fact that the 30 series cards, uh, specifically the 3080 and the 3090, are shorter. The PCB is shorter. So what you normally have is I think I can still take this apart here or move it around. What you normally have is the fans directing airflow out through the heat sinks, out through the front, especially in blower style 
uh, heat sinks where you have the blower fan here and it's directing all of your airflow out the front of the car there where your display connections are. For the 30 series cards, the PCB ends right here and the rest of it is a heat sink overhang. So this fan right here is pushing air directly through to the back of the card. Well, it's the back on the orientation that you have it in in your PC. So in the R11, all of this hot air coming from this heat sink gets pushed directly up into all the other components in that system. Your VRM on your motherboard, your RAM, everything else that's included. Uh, if you have one of the low profile coolers, it saturates that heat sink pretty easily. So not really great design on their part, but it's no fault of the 3090. That's just the way that these are designed. I've noticed that these are different lengths. That's why I'm putting them out where they go. So I can put this thing back together if it doesn't fit with the EK water block on there. Pop any of the chips off there. There we go. Okay, it's a nice little heat pipe here for the back plate. That's nice to see. And there you go. You can see you definitely have the the different caps in there. I know that was an issue before. I believe that the overall opinion is that that did not affect performance. Um, but you can see the different layout that they have on this specific card here. All right, I think we have to take these out first. Yeah, let's remove these three here. One there. And this does have HDMI and three display ports on there. So I can see that that little protection there, the mount, was connected to that kind of sub piece that metal sub piece there that is potentially cooling your VRM and your memory chips. We'll have to see when we pull this off here. So now let's go ahead and take the rest apart. Try not to jab the screwdriver into the PCB there. Don't want to pop any of those resistors off or any of those little components because I do not have the capabilities to repair. So if something does happen, <laughs> that's it. is on there quite hard. Just making sure everything is disconnected like it should be. It should come off slowly, slowly, slowly. there it is. So it is a separate piece that is cooling that. And there's two screws there. That's what I have to do. I have to take that off. Go ahead and remove these so we can see the difference between the main heat sink that has the heat pipes and then this little sub piece here. There we go. Okay. So there you go. That is what is cooling your memory as well as the VRMs there. Not the chokes, but the 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 actual VRMs. You can see you have two spots here and then the memory chips all the way around. So that is the only cooling. It is not connected to transfer heat from this main heat sink here. That is specifically only to cool the core there. So I'm wondering if that really had any impact on the speeds that I was getting, my overall scores. Um, the only way to tell really is to go ahead and hopefully that water block fits on there. So everything is cooled by water and then going ahead and doing the runs again, pushing it as far as I possibly can. We'll see if we get a higher score, then we'll know for sure. Okay, now it is time to bring out this guy here, this is the EK Quantum Vector GPU water block for 3080 and 3090 Founders Editions. Okay. So all we want to do without applying any thermal paste or anything is just make sure that this fits on there and all the screw holes and everything line up. If you look inside there, everything does line up the way it's supposed to, all the holes for the back plate, all line up. So what I'm gonna do now is 
I'm gonna try to clean these off the best I can. Of course, clean uh, this guy off first. The back side, I do have a back plate that I will be using for this, so I will get everything nice and clean, throw on the thermal pads that are required, and then button this up. Then what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be assembling a 360 millimeter radiator on here, throw some fans, I got a nice reservoir, and then hooking everything up, throwing some water in it, and seeing what kind of performance increase we can get. Okay, so we're back after a short hiatus to do some studio work. The curtains have been changed behind me, there's new studio lighting, and I've got a 49 inch addition on my desk there. So now that that's all taken care of, let's get back to Dell's 3090. So installing the water block on this was straightforward just as it should be. There were no differences between a Founders Edition and Dell's offering. After doing multiple temperature checks on both the memory and the core, you can see that there is good contact being made. One thing that I did notice was there is a heat pipe on the back plate of the stock cooler here. And I didn't really know what that was for until I realized that 3090s have such a large amount of memory that a good portion of it is on the back side. So the thermal pads that were on the stock cooler were actually making contact with that heat pipe to spread the heat away from those memory chips on the back. On the 2080 Ti, for instance, I've been running it with a water block and no backplate at all, and I've seen no degradation in performance. But I suspect that if you did the same here, you would see heat rise up on those back memory chips and it may cause some kind of thermal throttling. Fortunately enough, I did go for the backplate from EK, which has a generous amount of thermal pads and is nice and solidly constructed. So it will be able to take heat away from that quite efficiently. Now by just installing the water block on this and leaving all other settings stock, I was able to see an increase of about 300 points in both Port Royal and Superposition. My idle temps with this were around 28 degrees Celsius. That is about eight degrees above ambient. And under full load, this was getting up to a whopping 38 degrees. Now I haven't had a chance to see how high the temps would reach after reaching saturation, but judging by how low they are initially and through the various benchmarks that I did run, I don't expect them to be very high at all. So I took the same approach to overclocking that I did with the stock cooler and I landed on 260 megahertz increase on the core clock as well as 1300 megahertz increase on the memory. This gave me the highest repeatable score and put me in the top 150 in 1080p extreme, 4K and 8K optimized in superposition. Now this card won't be breaking any records, but it will hold its own against budget to mid-range offerings from other manufacturers. And for those of you that took the plunge on the Alienware R11 or R12, you can rest assured knowing that that 3090 tucked away underneath all of that plastic can in fact make its way into some pretty decent benchmark scores, given your thermals stay in check. That's gonna do it for today. Stay tuned for when I take this 3090 and I made it to a 5950X and throw it inside the Master Frame 700 case from Cooler Master for an extreme water cooling build. Don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe if you haven't already. I'm getting pretty close to a thousand subscribers. Thank you to everybody that subscribed so far. And when I get to that mark, I'll be doing a giveaway. So if you wanna find out the details on that, go ahead and head down to the description. There you can find a link to my Twitter as well as Patreon. I'll be posting the details on those. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next time.